Okay, let's get started. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Allie Ramstick, and I'm the Director of Human Services for the Town of Darien. And welcome to Demystifying Resilience in Children and Adolescents. Um, just a few housekeeping notes um, where this, this is being recorded. Um, and participants can type questions into the Q&A and you can choose to be anonymous. The chat um, option will be um, disabled. And at, going forward, we will, um, the Town of Darien and Kids in Crisis will have the recorded video on their websites and we will share it with all the participants and feel free to share it with those you know. Um, just a quick little opening statement. Research on resilience shows that building resilient skills is one of the most important things we can teach our children. Children and adolescents with good resilient skills are better able to cope and manage stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Just want to give you a little, um, let you know who's participated in this panel and thank you all in advance for all the hard work. Um, Wendy Chum is a social worker um, for Kids in Crisis. She's a teen talk counselor at Newtown High School. And Julianne Green is a social worker and she's director of grief and trauma services at family centers in Darien. And actually Julianne, maybe it's not just Darien, but I know that's where the Center for Hope is. Yes. Um, and George, is it? Okay. And Georgette Harrison is a licensed pro professional counselor and she's director of clinical and community partnerships at Child Guidance Center of Southern Connecticut. And Dr. Scott McCarthy is program director of special ed and student services for Darien Public Schools. So thank you all for participating. And I'm going to turn this over to Julianne to give us a little definition of resiliency or resilience. Thank you, Allie. So glad to be here with you all tonight. Um, just wanna start out by saying that this presentation is not a test or a question of whether our children are resilient or not. Um, the truth is resilience is a learned skill. It is a skill to be taught and fostered and practiced. And we are all here to tell you that you're most likely already doing an amazing job. We're just here to give you a few additional skills or ways of thinking about this when it comes to each of your individual children. I also wanna start by saying that language really matters. Um, when we were thinking about naming this presentation, we chose demystifying a fancy word versus building because we didn't want building resilience to become another thing on your really long to-do list as parents, right? So we wanted this to be low stakes, low pressure. You're just information gathering. You're here to learn um, and we'll kind of go from there. So resilience has really become such a buzzword. Um, I wanna take a step back here and allow ourselves to view our children through these additional lenses here. So the chances are yes, they are many of these things. If we look here at these synonyms, they are strong, they're persistent, um, they're able to persevere, they have grit, they're flexible, they're, they're, they're able to adapt. So maybe we're kind of focusing too much on the one-term resiliency and zooming out a little bit will, will help us with that. You can go ahead to the next slide. Wanted to touch a little bit on the four types of resiliency before we jump into the rest of the presentation here. So we have physical resilience, which is really thinking about the physical body and how the physical body deals with change, recovers from physical demands, illness, injuries. So think good sleeping habits, healthy lifestyle choices, exercise, sports teams, really good self-care and prioritizing self. There's also mental resilience, um, really referring to a person's ability to adapt and change to uncertainty. So people who possess this type of resilience are flexible and calm during times of crisis, and they're really able to remain hopeful and present in kind of a chaotic situation. Emotional resilience, being able to regulate emotions during a time of stress. Um, this type of resilience really helps people maintain a sense of optimism and an understanding that Adversity, difficult emotions, difficult scenarios are not permanent, they're temporary, right? So the ability to weave in and out of that temporary versus permanent thinking. And then of course we have social resilience or often referred to as community resilience as well. So allowing people to connect with others and work together to solve problems, um, issues that affect them individually, but also collectively and a bit more globally. 
So think about participating on a sports team or being a part of an extracurricular activity, a really solid friend group. Um, and again, that ability to kind of think outside of oneself and, and um, prioritize their community in kind of a larger group setting. Great. Thank you, Jillian. Of course. Um, so now we're going to watch a short video. Um, this video is um, by renowned author Julia Lithcott Hames, and she's authored two very, um, very popular books. One's called How to Raise an Adult and Break Free of the Overparenting Trap and Prepare Your Kid for Success. And the other is Your Turn, How to Be an Adult. So here we go. We're going to watch this for a few minutes and then continue. You know, I didn't set out to be a parenting expert. In fact, I'm not very interested in parenting per se. It's just that there's a certain style of parenting these days that is kind of messing up kids, impeding their chances to develop into their selves. There's a certain style of parenting these days that's getting in the way. I guess what I'm saying is we spend a lot of time being very concerned about parents who aren't involved enough in the lives of their kids and their education or their upbringing, and rightly so. But at the other end of the spectrum, there's a lot of harm going on there as well. Where parents feel a kid can't be successful unless the parent is protecting and preventing at every turn and hovering over every happening and micromanaging every moment and steering their kid towards some small subset of colleges and careers. When we raise kids this way, and I'll say we, because Lord knows in raising my two teenagers, I've had these tendencies myself. Our kids end up leading a kind of checklisted childhood. And here's what the checklisted childhood looks like. We keep them safe and sound and fed and watered. And then we wanna be sure they go to the right schools, but not just that, that they're in the right classes at the right schools, and that they get the right grades in the right classes in the right schools, but not just the grades, the scores, and not just the grades and scores, but the accolades and the awards and the sports and the activities and the leadership. We tell our kids, don't just join a club, start a club, because colleges wanna see that and check the box for community service. I mean, show the colleges you care about others. <laughs> And all of this is done to some hoped for degree of perfection. We expect our kids to perform at a level of perfection we were never asked to perform at ourselves. And so because so much is required, we think, well, then of course we parents have to argue with every teacher and principal and coach and referee and act like our kids concierge and personal handler and secretary. And then with our kids, our precious kids, we spend so much time nudging, cajoling, hinting, helping, haggling, nagging as the case may be, to be sure they're not screwing up, not closing doors, not ruining their future. Some hoped for admission to a tiny handful of colleges that deny almost every applicant. And here's what it feels like to be a kid in this checklisted childhood. First of all, there's no time for free play. There's no room in the afternoons because everything has to be enriching, we think. It's as if every piece of homework, every quiz, every activity is a make or break moment for this future we have in mind for them. And we absolve them of helping out around the house. And we even absolve them of getting enough sleep as long as they're checking off the items on their checklist. And in the checklisted childhood, we say we just want them to be happy. But when they come home from school, what we ask about all too often first is their homework and their grades. And they see in our faces that our approval, that our love, that their very worth comes from A's. And then we walk alongside them and offer clucking praise like a trainer at the Westminster Dog Show coaxing them to just jump a little higher and soar a little farther day after day after day. And when they get to high school, they don't say, well, what might I be interested in studying or doing as an activity? They go to counselors and they say, what do I need to do to get into the right college? And then when the grades start to roll in in high school and they're getting some Bs, 
or God forbid some C's, they frantically text their friends and say, has anyone ever gotten into the right college with these grades? And our kids, regardless of where they end up at the end of high school, they're breathless, they're brittle, they're a little burned out, they're a little old before their time, wishing the grown-ups in their lives had said, what you've done is enough, this effort you've put forth in childhood is enough. And they're withering now under high rates of anxiety and depression, and some of them are wondering, will this life ever turn out to have been worth it? Yeah. We're gonna turn it over to Georgette, and you're gonna move on to the next slide, right, Georgette? Yeah, thank you, Allie. So one of the things that we wanted to, to you know, share with all of you tonight is also, you know, what, what are the attributes of a resilient, a quote unquote resilient child? And um, sort of how do we know that we are um, talking to a, to a child who has developed these skills? So there are, there's a lot of research around resilience and what seemed to be sort of like this profile of a child who's resilient and what are the factors that seem to have contributed to that. And Scott will talk a little bit more about that a, a little later, but at the individual level, the research shows that a, a resilient child has a sense of autonomy, right? So one of the things that, um, that is mentioned in, in the video is this idea of um, a child feeling like, you know, they're just sort of going through the motions and, and trying to sort of check off this list of all these things that they're supposed to do in order to get to this, you know, goal that may or may not have been one of their goals. And it's incredibly important if you think about the experience of someone sort of moving around life feeling like they don't have a say, they don't have autonomy, they don't have a sense of um, like this belief that they can exert control over their own fate and they have the desire to do so. It is a developmental imperative in adolescents to want to exert control over their own fate and to feel like there's no opportunities to do that. That's incredibly difficult, I think, if we can put ourselves in that, in, in that position and imagine what that's like. So a resilient child is one that feels that they have a, a sense of self-efficacy. They also have social orientation, right? So they are looking outwards. They are thinking about their community. They are thinking about socializing and how to be um, good friends, good children, good students, good um, uh, members of their community. They also have um, a good tolerance for frustration. And this is incredibly important because we, especially in early childhood, we're thinking about all these skills, the pre-literacy skills and the sort of the, the learning how to recognize letters and numbers before we even get to kindergarten. And the research shows over and over and over and over again that those things do not matter in terms of a child's ability to be successful in school. What matters are social emotional skills like frustration tolerance, like helping your child develop those skills so that when things get hard, they don't break. They're, they figure out a way of being able to lean in. Another individual attribute is the ability to elicit support from others. Now, that's phrased that way for a reason. It's not that they want to elicit support from others because there are a lot of students out there who want to elicit support, but how do they do it? Do they elicit support by behaving in ways that are disruptive? In which case they're actually probably not gonna get the support they need, right? Because when they behave in those ways, people then try to discipline them or try to think about how to address the behavior and not really the underlying need. So it's really about understanding how can I ask for help at a time that's right in a way that's right and with the right person. They also have flexible coping strategies. So we all know the kids that maybe, you know, they have 
and adults, not just kids, right, that have learned one way of coping, and this is the way that they've learned how to cope. Let's say they throw themselves into their work, and this is this is what they do day in and day out, so that they don't need to think about maybe everything else that not, that is not going well. And then one day something happens where throwing yourself into work or your school just isn't as effective as it used to be. And then you're left with, I don't know how to help myself feel better because this is the only thing that I've ever known how to do. And so you need to have multiple ways of coping with um, disappointment and, um, and frustration. And what's also interesting is that children who are resilient also had flexibility in their gender role expectations. And what do I mean by that? So research is showing that boys who are um, characterized by those around them as sensitive, gentle, nurturing, and students who identify as girls who are ident who are characterized by those around them as being achievement oriented, independent, and feeling like um, like they 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 want to excel academically and professionally. Those are the children who actually, in the long run, tend to do better than those who seem to stay within rigidly defined gender roles. Next slide, please. So those were all the individual factors. There's also family factors. And one of the things that was mentioned in the video is this idea that because you know, our students are learning, they're, you know, they're doing this sport, they're doing this after school activity, they're now, you know, doing karate and swimming and all these things that we have to do to get our kids into a good school, because ultimately, we want them to have a good life, right? This is the only reason we're doing any of this, because we want them to have a good, healthy, happy life. And so we excuse them from doing things around the house right? This is their job is to do all of these things. However, the research shows that resilient children from the beginning, even as little people, their families had a family culture that um, valued age-appropriate required helpfulness. So kindergartners who are helping to clear the table, um, but there is an expectation that in this in this family, we help each other out. This is what we do as family members for each other. So they have chores. They have things that are expected of them that go beyond being a student. Also, again, the, the, the sort of tie into the social um, or the gender role expectations, families with socialization practices um, that defied sort of very um, defined gender or stereotypical gender roles, those children tend to do better. So for example, for girls in families where there isn't this sort of overt overprotectiveness and an emphasis on independence and where they feel like they have reliable emotional support from a primary caretaker, those girls tend to do better in the long run. And for boys, right, we often think about, you know, well, like boys are boys will be boys and they're just sort of going to go out and do their thing and then sort of, you know, the, um, they're sort of left to, to, to do the, the, what boys are going to do. The research actually shows that families that provide greater structure rules and parental supervision for boys compared to families that don't, those boys tend to do better in the long run. If they have a male source of identification, right, a positive source of identification of another male role model is really important for boys. And first and foremost is growing up in a family that actually encourages boys to express themselves emotionally. <clears throat> and then lastly, there's the environmental and community attributes. So for example, having a strong peer group, 
And we know that teenagers sort of, you know, change uh, uh, friend groups as they, you know, develop new interests. But if you have a child that's sort of, you know, friends with one friend group uh, one year and another friend group another year and another friend group another year, and they seem like they can't really sort of hold on to relationships, it means that your child probably is having difficulty repairing ruptures, that when things get difficult with friends, they tend to just break off. And we want to help foster those those social uh, relationships. You also have a positive sense of school. And they tend to have sort of a favorite teacher that they feel like they have a good relationship with. And they're in a school that is promoting whatever ability that child has, not just academic abilities, but whatever natural talents they bring to the table, they feel like that's being promoted. Thank you, Georgette. We do have a question. Um, the question is, you gave a list of skills that lead to resilience. What do we do if a child has a lot of deficits in these areas? For example, what if a child has low frustration tolerance and low coping skills as they head into the teenage years? Does this mean they are doomed to not achieve resilience? No. I mean, and, and I think this, the idea of sort of a child being doomed, I think is part of the reason why we... Um, I think we need to think about things in more um, shades of gray, right? It, a child is not like either sort of fully resilient or not resilient at all. Or, you know, we want to think about trajectories. We want to think about things that promote resilience. Um, but if you recognize that your child is really struggling in a lot of these social emotional skills, right? Like, not having a lot of coping mechanisms and, or skills and low frustration tolerance. It's important to think about as a family, why do we think that is? But also reach out to the experts in, in your community who can help um, teach as a family and, and teach your child like how, how to cope with disappointment and try to understand why this came to be, right? There's it never hurts to, to get um, more support, especially the, the younger they are. But even if they're older, there is never, there's a saying that like, you know, the best time to plant the tree was yesterday, but the second best time is today, right? There's always time the course correct. Wonderful. Thank you, Georgette. And now Scott, you are up. Sure. Um, so just piggybacking on, on sort of what Georgette was talking about a little bit, I think it's also, um, important for us to think about sort of any, um, any emotional factor that we have as people or as children as a continuum. Um, and so, you know, just like we think of, um, students in terms of their reading as on a continuum, it's also, uh, helpful to think about their emotional factors and, as, as, as being on a continuum. And so things like resilience, um, well, we know that, that, that the, the factors that lead to resiliency in children are unique factors. Um, I, I agree with Georgette that there's sort of a, um, a uh, uh, there's always room for us to continue to develop our really resiliency skills. And so that's what I wanna talk about a little bit today is sort of how do we, especially as parents, develop resiliency skills in kids. So. You know, George has said, resiliency is, is sort of an approach to life that views, you know, challenges um, and obstacles as sort of the essential part of your success. So, you know, how do we develop it? Um, well, the, to start, I think resiliency is, is just like a muscle. So um, it's something that we build through effort and repetition. Um, we want to keep that resiliency muscle strong, but we also want to make sure that it's flexible so that we can think to problem solve in different types of ways. And there are some general strategies that we can use to, to uh, increase our resiliency and, and to improve our resiliency in children. So um, the first is, is encouraging connection and helping others. So we know this in a variety of our emotional factors that encouraging connection and helping others are really important pieces and foundational uh, uh, blocks to that. So, you know, children, um, who oftentimes feel helpless really feel empowered when they help others. And so while it might sometimes think, uh, we might think that um, adding, on, adding on something else like helping other people might actually not necessarily 
um, be something that would lead to us feeling resilient, it actually really empowers our children and helps them helps them develop those resiliency skills. Um, another general strategy is maintaining routines, but also learning how to take practice, uh, take breaks and practice self care. Um, so, so we know that you know while some anxiety, a, 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 a reasonable amount of anxiety, can motivate us to take um, positive action. We also need to validate the, the range of feelings that all people have. So teaching our children to focus on something that they can control and that they can act on, um, helping by challenging unrealistic thinking, by asking them to you know, examine the, changes, or the, the chances of, of the worst case scenario happening and what, what they might tell a friend who's going through those worries, you know? um, not, not sort of dismissing what our children are saying when they're frustrated, but actually kind of asking them to help problem solve um, what, the, what they might do for another friend who's going through that same situation. Uh, that's part of that kind of um, um, model where we can validate the student um, or validate our child. So it's also important to, to set goals, um, you know, to help develop resiliency. So a, a big part of developing resiliency actually relates to identifying what those personal goals, goals are and then being able to, to tolerate discomfort um, that's creating resistance toward that goal. Um, so in, in school settings, we oftentimes use a, a SMART goal framework for students, um, and the SMART goal framework stands for, and, and many of you are probably familiar with the specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely framework. Um, and, and the reason that we use that is because many students kind of start off with either lofty, unattainable goals or goals that might not necessarily actually be connected to, um, to their work. So they'll say things like, I'm going to get straight A's next semester, or I'm going to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, do three clubs this year when I did zero last year. Um, sort of a goal that might not necessarily be attainable, and it also might just be sort of the end of something as opposed to not how are we going to get there. So the SMART framework really helps students outline what it, what are the things I'm going to do to get to those goals. Um, so when we're setting goals, it's really important um, in the home setting to model how to set goals and how, how to model goals that are appropriately ambitious. So here's kind of where I am and here's where I want to go. And um, as a parent, it's important to celebrate progress, not just success. So helping, helping your child learn to trust themselves, um, to solve problems and, and make appropriate decisions. So seeing um, how their individual accomplishments contribute to the well-being being of, of, of your home um, as a whole is, is just really an important part of that celebration of success and, and encouraging responsible risks. So um, we, of course, we want students to be successful and we don't want to set students up for not being successful, but encouraging them to take risks that, that we can reasonably, um, uh, we reasonably believe would be appropriate for them. And then last, it's really important to teach kids how to handle setbacks. So we know failure, failure setbacks, disappointment, they're sort of an expected part of learning. Um, and, and so what we wanna do is, is have, have them learn um, to be praised for their hard work and their perseverance and their grit, um, not just for their grades, um, not just for easy successes, um, but, but praising them for, um, for even being you know, able to handle a setback or even having a setback and talking about a setback. Um, that's really an important part of, of, of experiencing a setback. And we can do that by modeling learning from our own mistakes. So you know, I feel frustrated because I had a presentation at work and it didn't really go well. Um, and so I know I'll have another presentation and I'm gonna set some goals to be better prepared for that presentation. And those goals are going to look like this and actually be able to have them, um, your, you know, your child observe you, acknowledge that, that, some, that you had a setback and acknowledge that it's, it's okay. And then also acknowledge and, and make a plan to move forward. Um, maintaining a positive outlook without being dismissive. So it's, it's important um, uh, when, when your child comes home and says, I failed my math test and it's the end of the world, not just to shoot to the immediate, um, it's not the end of the world, it's not a big deal. That sort of dismisses dismisses their their feelings. It's important to sort of validate those and to to understand. I can understand how that could feel really frustrating. Even sharing some of your own experiences, you know, I've I've had failures before, and here's how I got through them. 
or kind of flipping it to that 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 idea we talked about before. You know, what would you tell a friend who is in a similar scenario right now? How would you help somebody problem solve or 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 kind of using that that framework of, you know, I I remember a time before where you didn't do so well on a test. How did you how did you end up doing better afterwards? What what did you do for yourself? Um, you know, and and labeling difficult emotions. And then labeling the appropriate responses to them, which is a lot of the work that we're doing with the ruler curriculum in the public schools and similar work can be done at home. So um, instead of I'm feeling really frustrated because I, you know, I worked hard on this presentation and it didn't go well. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to call out of work to tomorrow or I'm quitting my job or, or kind of modeling, you know, a sort of more extreme response that wouldn't necessarily match. You know, I feel really frustrated because I had worked hard on this presentation um, and it didn't go so well. And so, you know, I'm going to take a walk or I'm going to take a break. I'm going to decompress. I'm going to do something that makes me feel good. Like I'm going to call a friend. Um, I'm going to uh, watch a movie, you know, and not think about it for a while. Kind of modeling, like, what would an appropriate response be? And, and not just doing the response, but actually modeling the thinking about it. I felt frustrated, so I'm doing X. Again, kind of giving them that model of it's okay to have a setback. And here's how I'm how I'm remedying that setback because it is okay and I will move forward. And 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 that helps us talk about those times where we need to be resilient as well. We can go to the next slide. Yep. And Scott, if it's okay, I'd love to just jump in on something you were sharing because I think it's so important. Um, that piece about modeling, right? If we think about a six-month-old baby who's just about to start eating some solid foods. The recommendation is that that baby sit at the table with their family so they can watch their family members eat and learn how to eat, right? It's a learned skill, it's a learned behavior. And we do that all throughout their life, right? We're teaching a kid how to play a sport. How do we do that? We go and we show them the sport, we play with them. And that modeling tends to stop when it, when it ebbs from a physical teaching and learning into an emotional and parents often, you know, think or believe that they need to be so buttoned up and they need to have it all together. And so they're just modeling, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. But if all we're modeling is it's okay and going right to that next thing and we're not giving our children a glimpse into those hard times, right? There needs to be appropriate boundaries. We don't want our children involved in like everything that we're going through, but there is some healthy exposure there and some really important modeling. And so if you're having some difficulties or you don't see that resilience in your child, really taking the time to model that. Um, Scott, I love those examples that you gave and I think they're so important and really, you know, talking through your day, right? Oh gosh, I just got off such a hard presentation. Like Scott was saying, I am going to go for a walk. And we learn by, by seeing and we learn by observing. And so really being aware and um, really obvious in that modeling with kids, I think is, is really important. Thank you for touching on that. Of course. Um, thank you, Julian and Scott. Um, I think everything you guys said, it's, it's right on, on what we're trying to teach through this presentation. And, um, you know, this are, this is a list of some of the challenges that, you know, students that I work with or kids that we've all kind of interacted with, we see their resiliency skills being tested and kind of put to the test. Um, you know, like students and kids experience a tremendous amount of physical and like mental growth on a daily basis between, you know, school, their extracurricular activities, their work, their social lives, they're always being challenged and, and challenged and, you know, put to the test on how they can handle setbacks and kind of how they can learn from mistakes. Um, you know, innately, like all kids are resilient. Um, but sometimes when fear and insecurity and doubt kind of takes over, that's where like the resiliency and the stress kind of like gets in the way of them knowing what to do. Um, so it's important that the, the, the skills that Scott touched on, um, and Julian also like the modeling that do, it doesn't only happen when these situations are happening, but then it happens in small ways every single day. There's always a learning opportunity for students and for kids. Um, and I think like Julian said, like, modeling it's a very important thing and I think we are all very surprised when we are vulnerable with kids how they respond to that right um and how open they feel and comfortable they feel once they know that they're in a safe space with someone that's also comfortable being open and vulnerable um 
working in a school, I think, you know, going back to the question that was given to the Q&A, um, I see kids and I work with kids that have low tolerance and that they just don't know how to respond to situations. And it's not something that they're doomed or something that they can't learn. I think at the beginning, you talked about how this is a learned skill. And those situations where maybe their tolerance is tested, it's a great opportunity to talk about and go back and say, okay, well, you know, this response, you weren't happy with how you responded to this. This is not giving you the, the outcome that you want. How can we learn to respond differently to that? How can we learn to build tolerance to a certain situation uh, and prepare for certain situations, right? Um, I think transitions in school, I think I've seen since COVID, you know, coming back to school and, and change that change in environment, a lot of students struggle with that, adults struggle with that as well. Um, and like having the conversations and preparing for those changes. And you can't prepare students to, for every single change that they're gonna experience on a day-to-day -day life uh, um, in their lives, but you can prepare like a foundation for them to at least have some skills in their toolkit for them to know how to deal with it. Um, and you know, those skills go back to what Scott was mentioning, kind of setting routines for them, having these open conversations, um, allowing them to be okay with making mistakes and being comfortable with making those mistakes because and teaching that they can learn from them. Um, and that mistakes are not a bad thing, but they're just like a learning opportunity to kind of get to the place that they want to be. Thank you, Wendy. Um, thank you all. Um, are there any questions that anyone has? Um, feel free to put them in the chat and I can and ask the panel or else I can ask some questions myself. I'll give you guys a minute. Um, well, here's one I'll start while we're waiting to see if people have questions. Um, so how does a parent address a child that seems to be losing or lost their ability to be resilient? Anyone? <laughs> Um, I can I can say something to that. I feel like a, a kid cannot lose their resiliency. Like it just might look differently depending on the situation and, and where they are. Um, and I think it's just understanding of like, you need to meet the student where it is and see what their resiliency looks like in that moment and what they're capable of, you know, learning in that, in that moment. Mm -hmm. And Wendy, I think that's such an important Point. It's so human of us to want to like really strictly define resilience and put it in a box and put our kids in a box like you're resilient, yes or no. And it really is this spectrum, right? We talked in the beginning of the different types of resiliency, the different skill sets, the different examples. It's not, and Georgette, you spoke so beautifully saying there's so much gray here and it isn't so black and white. There is a lot of gray um, and we have to allow children to be in that space, right? And not put that added pressure that we were talking about in that video earlier. We're then adding pressure to say yes or no, you're resilient or not, right? And so acknowledging that it's a spectrum, it's gonna ebb and it's gonna flow and change between situation to situation um, is really important. I was gonna say too that, um, you know, a metaphor that I've used before with, with parents when we think about resiliency is a metaphor that we use in a lot of areas of mental health um, where, we, where we consider something a bucket. Um, and so uh, if you think about resiliency as, as sort of a bucket um, where when the bucket becomes full, we're unable to use our resiliency skills and each thing that we put in the bucket is a factor that overwhelms us. You can see, and we see this all the time, a student has appropriate responses to stress. They have appropriate coping mechanisms through school. And as the bucket becomes more full, eventually it overflows. Um, and things that you add to your bucket are sort of those factors that are underlying resilience, things like our sleep, our eating patterns, um, our connections with our peers, um, and things that, um, uh, uh, can, can kind of result in those things kind of going over is being overwhelmed and overstressed, um, uh, you know, not maintaining appropriate sleep patterns. Um, and, and, and when you see those things kind of happen repetitively and start to tax the system, 
that's when I think we sometimes see that there's all of a sudden a change in what we'd see in resilience. It may not be that our, our child lost their skills, but they're not able to employ the skills because there's too much going on right now for them. And so sometimes that kind of goes back to the, to the, the video that we listened to. Um, sometimes we actually have to remove things from the bucket. Um, uh, we don't need to take five AP classes because taking five AP classes, but not being able to respond to any stressors in those classes is worse than taking three, but doing very well and man managing our stress. So it kind of thinking of, of our abilities to respond to stress as kind of a collection of factors that come together um, and thinking about those individual factors rel relative to our, our child is really important. I love that. I, um, Sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Um, no, it is that I love that bucket metaphor, Scott. Go mm -hmm. ahead, Joyce. You know, I, I think one of the things that we can sort of harken back to or, or, or think back to is um, to, to, to sort of um, really make what Scott is, is talking about like really concrete for us is like, let's think about the beginning of the pandemic when we're all stuck at home. Right. And we're all having to, uh, you know, play both like teacher, cook, uh, cruise director, like mental health provider, like all these things that we had to do as, as parents when we were all stuck at home in the midst of a, a tremendous amount of fear. How well were we responding to minor stressors, like whether we could get that uh, stop and short stop and shop order in, or have all the slots been uh, occupied? And now that means I, I I may or may not have food, or I have to go out into the supermarket. Right? We might be have or we might be flipping our lids because we can't get that stop and shop order in. We were not adequately resourced. I mean, I don't know about any of you. I did some really wonky things as a parent when we were all stuck at home. <laughs> but what resilience looked like for me sometimes in those early days is that I, I maybe changed out of my yoga pants and into actual pants in order to go to work. That was resilience for me at that point, right? Like, And so I think also differentiating between when is our child having a tough time right now because you know it is an appropriate response to let's say you know finals week and they will sort of flip their lids quite easily and being able to give them a little grace is different than like my child has been struggling and it's been months and they're still struggling and then grace is not enough now we need to think about how do we provide additional supports to help them recover from this, right? But context is everything. And I think us being able to think back to how we react when we are not adequately resourced. And is this like a, a, a like an, an episodic thing, right? Like this is a discrete event or time period, or is this going on for months? I think that determines what you do as a parent. Thank you, Georgia. Georgia, I think it's so important when, when we're focusing on the kids and the students, we then get further and further away from, from the adults and the role that the adults take in this. And what you said is so important because it is important to give the kids grace. It's also important to go back to that video and think about how are we parenting, right? Are we helping or hindering when it comes to resilience? Are we a helicopter parent looking at everything from above? Are we a snowplow parent who's like snow plowing the way for our kid and removing any and all obstacles and not even giving them a chance to become resilient, right? And so I do think that it, would, it could almost be like a part two of this pres uh, presentation of like self-reflection when it comes to resiliency. But it's so important to think about ourselves and how we're navigating our own resilience, not even just modeling it for them, but are we giving them the space they even need to become resilient is, is also so, so important. Thank you, Julianne. We do have a question in the chat. Um, how can a parent help a child navigate mistakes that really are bad, where a child crosses a line that could have significant consequences?
Hmm. Everyone's deep in thought. <laughs> my my first instinct is I to say approach with curiosity, right? If we go in um, the lecturing, right? The chances are they already know that this was wrong or bad. They already know what the consequences could be. Um, and so approaching with curiosity and asking like, why, right? How did you get in this situation? What happened? Um, and trying your very, very best to do that from a non-judgmental space and not a place of anger. Um, and so utilizing some of your own coping skills and your own resiliency skills to kind of neutralize yourself before jumping into that conversation. But you go ahead, Wendy. I'm sure you have like the top five tips for this one. <laughs> Um, no, I was just going to actually add from what you were saying before of like the self-reflection and finding that balance between being like the helicopter parent and then also like the snowplow parent, like want to take all the all the consequences and everything away from your kid. But one of the things that we talked about that makes a resilient kid, it's like the autonomy, that ability to take accountability. So in a situation like this, when there's a kid that there's, you know, big consequences coming, it's letting them know that you'll be there for them, but you're not gonna fix it for them. Um, and kind of walking each step with them and building that autonomy of like, well, but with that curiosity, right? Like asking the questions that maybe they haven't thought about or, or kind of guiding their thoughts into, well, what could we have done differently to avoid the situation? Or, well, we're in the situation now. So what are the options that we have? Again, building the autonomy and allowing them to see, because you know a lot of, teenagers and kids they don't see the world how we see it like adults see it most of the time right that there's options there's not just black and white there's that gray area kids are learning that through these years that they're in so kind of teaching that resiliency of like something happened but that's not the end of it other there's different roads that you can still take from this so I think it's like working on that one component of resilience of like autonomy and like but doing it and like you're not alone going through it. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, just you're not alone. And I was going to add to that. Um, you know, I I, I think um, considering the, the the question sort of around um, when your child is doing something that it, or, or displaying behaviors that are extremely concerning as sort of a representation of them not being able to be resilient. If we think about it through that lens. Um, I think we have to think about the developmental appropriateness of what they're doing. So kind of back to like what Julianne said, like, you know, um, toddlers, for example, we need them to try to, um, to take risks uh, and developmentally appropriate risks. We want them to be walking. We want them to try getting up on the step, but we don't let them go to the 10th step by themselves and stand at the top, right? So we monitor them. And when they're they're entering a risk space that is highly concerning or could be dangerous, that is our job as parents or our adults to step in and say that that's not an appropriate risk that I can allow you to take. Um, and so I think what what we observe a lot is that that understanding of what is a developmentally appropriate risk to take um, is is important. It is developmentally appropriate for a high schooler to push the boundary of, of when they study for a test sometimes and, and wait till last minute. That is developmentally appropriate. And it's important for us to model that that one bad grade isn't going to be the end of their academic career. And so, um, so there's a difference between that and them um, utilizing a substance to handle a situation that could be dangerous. That's not developmentally appropriate. So it's, it's important for us to consider um, resiliency in the context of developmental appropriateness when we help our kids kind of like when we put the bumpers on what's appropriate for them to do and when we will intervene and be that bumper and say you've gone too far and I've got to kind of bring you back and model model something different for you. Absolutely and and I love that you said that because I think that the the thing that stood out about the question is this idea of significant consequences right? Like when a child crosses a line that has significant consequences, what makes those consequences significant is in the eye of the beholder in that moment, right? And so like Scott said, if you have a child who got drunk and drove, 
that it's very different than let's say a child who maybe willingly decided that they were not going to study and they got a D in their test. But if you feel like the D in the test is a significant consequence because a D in a test means that their GPA goes down, which then means that they are not going to be able to get into, I don't know, the National Honor Society, which then means, that, right, like you're 20 steps down the line and you're thinking, my child will not have the life that I want them to have. What you end up disciplining is not, they didn't study for a test. What you end up disciplining, first of all, is from a place of fear and something that hasn't even happened yet. But because you feel like that, that is so dire that you have to sort of, you know, put the foot down in order to make sure that that doesn't happen. But then the consequence, right? The punishment doesn't fit the crime, right? And so when you think about significant consequences is to think about like, why do I think this is significant? And is this significant right now? Or is it that I'm thinking this, if I don't sort of address this right now, we're going in a really bad direction 20 years down the line. Thank you all. One more question, we're getting close to the end here, but I just wanted to put out there. Um, so how do you know when your concerns rise to the level to look for professional help and what kind of professional help should you seek? Social worker, counselor, psychologist, or, uh, or pediatrician? I mean, I think that that is a really individual question because you all know your kids best. Um, what I recommend is starting the conversation really early around um, mental health support and what that looks like, really normalizing that, um, having open conversations if someone in your family is seeking therapy, um, not hiding that or, you know, um, kind of keeping that quiet, but being really open about it. Um, and that way you can have an open conversation and the mental health service doesn't become then the consequence, right? You're really struggling or you're failing your class or, you know, you, you know, did X, which caused this consequence. Why? Like, we don't want it to be the consequence. We want it to be something that helps them, um, something that supports them. And so my recommendation is to always talk about that openly and honestly. Um, I think just adding to that, working out of school, I think that kids tend to go seek help to what's the closest to them to, you know, I think they're more hesitant if they're like, oh, I have to go to a pediatrician to like talk about this to a doctor, their guard comes up, right? But if if I think like, like Julian said, like starting the conversation of like, well, they spend a lot of time in school. So what are the resources of school? And it doesn't necessarily mean that they, something needs to be going wrong for them to reach out to these people. They can just go and, and these are just people there to help. Um, so I think kind of like doing, using the strengths that they have at school and the resources at school, I think it's what I've seen, it's always um, a positive way of, getting the right services for them in place. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for, for participating. Thank you to Julian, Georgette, Wendy, Scott, Kids in Crisis, Paula from Kids in Crisis for setting up the whole um, PowerPoint. And here's all of our contact information and you will be getting um, the email with the link to this to the PowerPoint. Um, and to the to the recording. So please feel free to share or reach out to any of us if we can be of any help. Um, and I wish you all a good night. Thank you so much.